We are Irish Side of the Moon. Freedom of information. Personal empowerment. The Irish Side of the Moon. I still have a dream. There are many sources of energy available. Everything is energy. My God, do we need this one. Free our mind. My corporations have taken over the world. Freedom of information. Personal empowerment. The Irish Side of the Moon. Hello and welcome to the show we call The Irish Side of the Moon. My name is Gabriel Logue. I'll be your host this week, back after a little break down here in sunny Lanzarote. Sunny now, uh, no chemtrails that I can see. Okay, if you're a long-time listener or a brand new listener, whether you're listening to us on our own site, the Irish Side of the Moon.blogspot.com, or you're downloading us from iTunes or you're tuning in on your local AM FM radio station. Hello, thank you for coming back again and listen to some more of our meandering tales with some fabulous guests. Now, if you haven't heard last week's show, um, our very own Michael Letty interviewed Jonathan Gray. And if you want to hear any of the previous interviews, just pop along to the Irish side of the moon dot blogspot dot com. Go to uh, previous Irish side interviews and you can listen to any of those and for our Facebook followers hello thanks for all the comments and keep up the good work and if you haven't joined the Facebook page just drop along to the Irish side of the moon Facebook page uh, lots happening on the planet right now um, on a global scale national scale there's cosmic alignments photon belts people are talking of all sorts of weird and wonderful things and Lots of not so nice things happen on the planet. So, our next guest hopefully will be able to shed some light on the bigger picture of what is happening on planet Earth and indeed the whole solar system. And joining me right now uh, on the show is Mr. James Gilliland. Uh, most recently, James has been featured in John Savage's and Michael Knight's documentary, Contact Has Begun His Story with James Gilliland. He has been a frequent guest on the Coast to Coast AM show and on the Jeff Rentz sightings on the radio, Laura Lee show, Millennium Mysteries, Sean David Morton and Shine Talk, where he demonstrated charging nine batteries in a row by merely holding them and other numerous radio shows. He has been a speaker at many events and featured on the History Channel's UFOs, Then and Now, Hotspots, ABC and Fox News, King 5 Seattle, TV's Evening Magazine, Elaine Smitha, Deline Gates, Simply Spiritual, Off the Record with Tom Lohman, International UFO Congress and many other national and now international TV, radio and other media events. His articles on UFO reports have been featured by Magical Blend and UFO Magazine and have been regularly featured by major UFO information outlets such as Filers Flies, UFO Roundup, Cos, MUFON, Skywatch International, PSI applications and on and on and here he is for the first time on the Irish side of the moon James Gilliland James you are so welcome well thanks for having me on the show not a hey, my pleasure my pleasure now for anyone who hasn't heard ever of E SETI or James Gilliland can you give us a background um, about yourself first of all um, as a young well as a child and as a young man and the journey you took and some of the experiences you had that led you to what you're doing. Yeah, great. I, I mean, I, I love to share this, but not with the, uh, you know, actually have a disclaimer in there, too, is that I'm, I'm not anybody's guru and I'm not, you know, here for the notoriety or, or any of that that, you know, people need to go within. And although I've had, you know, an amazing life and an incredible life and some some pretty outrageous adventures, uh, those, <clears throat> you know, are really open to everybody, you know, whoever chooses to, you know, open up to these, these higher dimensional realities. But basically it began, uh, I would say that the major beginning was at the age of five when I had uh, bronchial pneumonia and I was going in and out of consciousness and having beings come to me. And there was a woman, she was all in blue, had a beautiful blue light around her, and she was, you know, stroking my head and talking to me, and and uh, eventually she gave me a substance that I ate that it 
was kind of like the consistency of ice cream. It was white, and and then I pulled right out of it. I, I, was, I wasn't sick after that. I didn't miss a day of school after that. And that was my first experience, <clears throat> you know, with, with realizing that there are higher dimensional beings out there to help us. And, uh, and then I went through school like everybody else and had, you know, all of that pretty much, you know, drilled out of me, uh, uh, you know, and, and went to a Catholic school and had the, had the uh, Christ kicked out of me. <laughs> and, uh, you know, and, uh, and basically, you know, I went through that whole process and then I had another drowning at the age of 25. And and when I drowned, that near-death experience, that was where I just totally uh, went through the tunnel and went into this golden plane of bliss. And and that completely changed my life after that. And so so that started a 30-plus year um, journey studying with all kinds of different lamas and yogis and and taking every process-oriented therapy you could imagine and, and, uh, and just, you know, you know, really focusing on on service. You know, throughout that whole whole time period, and and then uh, I kept having these visions. <clears throat> a couple of visions. One, I had visions of some some huge tsunamis. You know, coming to the area, and that was in Northern California. They haven't hit yet, but they're right around the corner. And actually, one just hit a small one, and just hit and did quite a lot of damage to the to the boats and the docks and things. But you know, that was what just. What age were you when you had these particular visions? About, well, I would say, let me see, I was 20. It happened after the near-death experience. I, I had just one vision after another, and I kept seeing things uh, in the future. You know, a lot of different visions. There are just too many to even, you know, talk about. But uh, Okay. Uh, were you able to, was there any time reference or was there any point of reference uh, in the future um, associated with the visions or were they just the visions themselves and you, d you just knew they were in the future but you didn't know when? Yeah, it's kind of hard because you see the visions and you see the events unfolding and then you, you have a feeling and then my guides would tell me, you know, when, uh, roughly when they would happen. And, you know, I read about them back in 90, 1982 and, and they're in the book Becoming Gods and the first edition of that, I gave very specific information, a date, everything, you know, about Japan, what was going to happen there, and the tsunamis, and, and everything it all, was all in the book. And then the publishers got uh, pretty upset about that, and they, they, they really put pressure on me and said, st you know, stop with the dates and, and the exact places and just give it more generic. So I did in the second book, you know, give a more generic series of events, but, uh, you know, it's, it's just about all of these events I witnessed ahead of time. The San Francisco earthquake that, that took down the freeways and all the other problems there, uh, I, w I gave that three or four years ahead of time and, and uh, spoke to all the churches, all the, the, uh, the basically New Age or spiritual groups there and, and told them exactly when and where that was going to happen and, and pretty much got run out of town for that one <laughs> because... You know, none of them listen. They all said you're just creating doom and gloom and fear. And uh, and then even after it happened, there was no whatsoever. It was just, you know, attacking me, saying I created it because I talked about it. And I said, well, thanks for all the power, you know, you're giving me. But uh, uh, you know, that's not the case. <laughs> you know, it's like that's the last thing on earth I'd like to see is you know a lot of people, you know, you know, lose their loved ones and die, you know, pain and suffering that goes with it. But, I mean, that's the reason for these prophecies. That's why they're telling us and showing us, saying, hey, uh, look, you know, you, you need to get busy. Either start cleaning up our act here and start getting some divine intervention in these areas, and uh, we can alter these events, or, or this is what's on the books. And that's the way I look at it. Okay, um, question for you. The publishers come into bear with the stop with the specific dates. What mm -hmm. reason did they give you for uh, saying that? Well, in a way, it's pretty wise because when you see these events and try to nail them down, uh, time is really fluctuating. You know, and, and even the Bible, they talk about time and a half. 
And what they're saying is that these events are on the schedule, and then we get a grace period. You know, we're actually given a grace period because time is not fixed. It can be moved, pushed forward or backward, these events in time. And, uh, and, and you know, there is a lot of wisdom to that because it, it's very hard to nail things down at an exact time. And, and, you know, there would be a lot of people capitalizing on that. You know, they would pull all their money out of the stock market right at that time and invest in something else, you know, somewhere else. And, and uh, you know, there's, there's a lot of different reasons for that. So, you know, I did see the wisdom in, in a lot of what they're saying. Okay. Okay. So after your near-death experience um, and um, your, I suppose, well, your near-death experience at the age of 25 and there on, what what actions did you take? Uh, how much resistance within yourself did you have to actually say, right, um, I've had enough of the old life. Uh, I need to veer off and focus completely on something uh, new, such as service, love, healing. Mm -hmm. um, what, what sort of process did you go through yourself? Uh, ask this question so that uh, anyone out there who may be uh, experiencing something similar has mm -hmm. a friend uh, who's sharing something with them. Yeah, that, that, well, basically what happened is I know this happens in degrees to, to people. I mean, everybody's going through it right now and they're having to completely reevaluate, you know, everything, their relationships, their jobs, how they're interacting with humanity, earth, you know, the whole, whole enchilada basically. So everybody is going through that to one degree or another. I went through the crash course where after the near-death experience, I was completely changed, and I was super sensitive. Um, I would hear what people thought and what they felt. You know, I'd feel what they felt, and then they would say something completely different, and it was it was not congruent, and it was just driving me nuts. And, and at the time, I was in commercial real estate, you know, and, and everybody was just trying to screw each other and sue each other, and... And, uh, you know, you had to watch your backside constantly and be very careful with, with any kind of transaction. But, you know, it, it was just not uh, a very good environment for me to be in. I, I couldn't handle the energies because I was no longer frequency specific to that reality. And I just left, you know, pretty much gave away most of my stuff and just headed off. And I started actually doing some construction work up in the high desert uh, just to take some time to get my head together. Okay. Okay, well, that's a ways move. Yeah. Uh, okay, so um, where does the East City Ranch um, and your your next little uh, venture, when did that begin? Well, what happened was uh, I, I was in Santa Cruz and I saw the earthquake coming and, and the other events after that coming. I saw the whole scenario and, and I realized, you know, I, I wasn't a place that I wanted to create any permanence, you know. And uh, the I started seeing visions over and over of this beautiful mountain, you know, Mount Adams and a river next to it. I was looking down on it and there's a little, really small mountain behind it and and then I kept seeing the words Little Mountain across the vision, you know, over and over again. And I said, you know, this makes no sense. I mean, here's this massive mountain. I didn't know where it was. And they kept saying Little Mountain. And so what's weird is I ended up right at the base of Little Mountain and on Little Mountain Road. <laughs> you know? So, okay. from that, yeah, so now I understand what that was about because, you know, a lot of the visions don't make sense until afterwards until you have the experience and you go okay now i know what they're saying you know now now i understand it because our minds just sometimes can't wrap around you know you know the other events and what they're really showing us but that was the the beginning of it and then i found it on a map using you know pendulums and other forms of divination and my hand got real hot over this area and and then the uh circumstances uh opened up that I was offered, you know, a job here in this area and to help open up a, an import store and some other things and it just, and, and everything felt right and so I just packed up and took off and followed it and, and I ended up right, you know, through a lot of chain of events exactly where I'm supposed to be now, you know, on this very property. Okay, so you, uh, you trusted, you trusted the, in your, your, 
your intuition and your your guidance. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, I actually I threw the map in my closet and forgot about it after I marked everything on the map, and and then just followed my inner guidance, and, and I ended up exactly where the pinpoint on the map was. It was kind of funny going back. I go, holy smoke, that's exactly <laughs> where we circled, you know, on the map. Uh, yeah. It's nice to do that to go back and see. Okay, there you go. Like you said, just a lot of things don't make sense in the moment, and your mind can't get around it because, well, the mm-hmm. mind can't. Um, so, um, tell everyone and myself included, uh, what is um, the mission statement or the prime purpose uh, of, or the primary purpose of, of the East City Ranch and everything that you're trying to accomplish there? What is it? Uh, what is it you do, um, mm-hmm. how is it you do it, and why? Okay. Yeah, the main goal here is the awakening and healing of humanity and the earth. It's pure service-oriented, you know, what we do here, and and that's the main focus. And, and then what happened is we were doing a lot of, teaching a lot of meditation practices uh, from the East, you know, uh, yoga practices, uh, Lama traditions, things like that. Uh, doing a lot of things of that nature, doing a lot of process-oriented therapies here as well, and just living a very close-to-the-earth life. You know, we were living in harmony with each other and the planet. And uh, and that being so, we rose to the level of, of having contact with these extremely spiritually and technologically advanced beings, you know, these off-world visitors. And, and what I found out with our process here is that that wasn't the original intent. It evolved into that. And and because of that, now we're having masters, uh, saints, and sages appear here. We're actually photographing them. We're having these incredible light ships coming over the property. We've, we've got footage of them landing, morphing into three, back to one again, showing physics beyond in, in imagination and uh, more of a spiritual technology. And, and, you know, this has been going on now for, it started when I first got here on an energetic and telepathic level, but now it's in the physical level where we're actually filming and photographing it, and, uh, and people are having just phenomenal experiences here. And how long is the ranch, how long have you had uh, sort of a base there? 25 years. Okay. Okay, so... Um, would it be safe to assume that um, anyone that would want, and I'm, I'm posting this to myself as well, uh, anyone that would want to call in uh, help from the divine, from the higher dimensions, um, really has to do a lot of work on themselves first. Um, there's no point in going off half-cocked, blaming mm-hmm. um, corporations, blaming um, external yeah. events whilst carrying anger, jealousy, and envy, as I do right now. Um, <laughs> well, uh, that is what it is. Um, I've just I've, mm-hmm. I've moved down to Lanzarote myself. Uh, I just ch- changed everything in my life. I was living in mm-hmm. Ireland and just decided, right, enough's enough. Um, so I moved down here to Lanzarote, and lo and behold, in the first two days, I've seen loads of chemtrails, but that's oh, we'll get back to that. So <laughs> it's safe to assume that you really got to work on yourself first because they can't come down and do our work for us we have to as you say raise our conscious vibrations up so that we can at least meet them halfway is that mm-hmm. sort of close to what needs to be done you know exactly basically what they say is, is all you need you know is an open mind a loving heart and pure intent and, and they will work with us they don't care for rocket scientists or or anything else that's not important to them they're, they're more interested in soul quality and, uh, you know, people that are, are you know, service-oriented, uh, those are the people they like to work with. Uh, you know, the people with pumped-up egos that just seek power and wealth, uh, they have no desire to work with them whatsoever, and, and those beings don't even have a clue as to who these higher-dimensional beings are because they haven't risen to the occasion. And, and so they, you know, they know they exist. They've monitored their ships. And they know they're coming and going whenever they want, and they also know there's absolutely nothing they can do about it. But they really don't know who they are or what their agendas are or anything else. So they perceive it as a threat, and and it is a threat. Yeah, basically, it those who are acting in a way that's harmful to humanity because 
you know, any higher knowledge, wisdom, and higher uh, knowledge, especially spiritual technology, is going to be a threat to the status quo and those, you know, the war and disease profiteers and those people who are capitalizing at the expense of humanity and nature. Okay, when you talk about spiritual technology, can you break that into simple language for myself and everyone mm -hmm. listening? Well, basically, the, the easiest way to explain it is that there is a vibrational continuum. And, and if you look at the electromagnetic light spectrum, you'll, you'll have a better understanding of the different dimensions because they all fit within that. And, and just as there is all this incredible life on this third dimension, I mean, I think, I think we're up to something like 500 million uh, Earth-like planets out there that could sustain life. <clears throat> you know, they've really found with the new, new uh, infrared telescopes, and and uh, I can't remember what it is, something like, I don't know how many, I know they're up to like 200 billion suns in our little Milky Way galaxy alone. So so I think that number's even gone up as well. But, I mean, you look at the sheer numbers in this third dimension and just look at the life on Earth, the diversity of life here on Earth, and then now they know there's at least 11 more dimensions out there, and these two are full of life. There's so much life in the universe, it, you can't even wrap your head around it. And, and to think that we're the only thing, you know, the only God's creation, you know, you know, this little ball zipping around the planet, I mean, around the sun, you know, is, is it. And this mass multiverse is just, I, I can't even comprehend that, that 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 would be the case. It, it's, so, it's so ridiculous, the numbers, it makes no sense whatsoever. It would be a very limited creator, you know, that would be involved in, in, uh, in just creating one little speck of dust revolving around the sun in this in extremely vast multiverse. Okay. Um, and how, how does that relate then to spiritual technology? What, what exactly is spiritual technology. Yeah, well, basically, yeah, I'll go further into that. Yeah, so but, so basically, you know, we are multidimensional beings existing on a vibrational continuum. And and so the way you look at it is that you take matter, you know, or mass or whatever, you have you have mass, you raise its frequency, it becomes energy. You raise its frequency one more time, it becomes light. You raise the frequency again, it becomes consciousness. So it actually moves from consciousness to light to energy to mass, and that's that's the process of creation. And our physical, we have energy bodies, and we have light bodies, and, and we have another aspect of ourselves that's just pure consciousness and energy. And and I'm kind of explaining the different dimensions to different degrees, but you know there are beings out there that have physical bodies just like we do, and they have their physical craft, and we have our back-engineered craft as well. We've been doing that for quite some time. And, and there they, are beings that are less dense physical that have crafts that aren't quite physical. And we have a lot of photographs. So they're harder to photograph because they're not quite physical, but you can see the outline of the ship. They're a little fuzzy because of the fields of energy. And then, and then you have ships that are just pure energy, and you, know, you see them as just a big ball of energy. And that's it. And the beings on them are energetic beings. They have energy bodies. And then you have the light ships with beings with like magnetized light bodies on ships. And and those are extremely advanced beings, you know, on those ships. And then you have beings that don't even need any kind of expression at all, like form. They're just pure consciousness. You know, they're they're God beings, whatever you want to call it. They can give it names, but uh, but we ourselves, we most people on Earth uh, believe they're just a body and a personality, a spirit that has a body and a personality, and that spirit has many dimensions to it, and and they can go all the way back to source itself and become one with that, and then or express anywhere along that vibrational continuum. And, and this, this is what the true teachings of Jesus were. You know, he talked about that. His prayer was, Beloved Father, let them become one as we are one. And, and in his teaching, if you look at his path, his first thing he said was, he said that I am the Son of Man. 
so his identity was the son of Joseph and Mary, and and so so he was the son of man, or whatever, uh, depending on which story you believe. <laughs> and then later on, he said that yeah. You know, later on, he said that I'm I'm you know uh, I'm a messenger. You know, I'm a messenger of, of God, basically. So he started receiving input and messages. And then those messages, in those messages, he started passing them on to others, and he, and he started realizing, wait a second, I'm, I'm a spirit. I came from the source. I'm a son of God. I'm not, I'm not just this body and this personality with parents. I'm far beyond that. And then the last thing he said was, I am God, you know, and they tried to stone him. But, but what he was saying is that he became one with the one consciousness that encompasses all planes and dimensions throughout the multiverse, and and that was the message that he gave us, and we can do that. And the more that we do that, the, the greatest shift you're ever going to experience is is this body, this soul and spirit. That's the shift that can go all the way back to the source itself. And uh, it's totally unlimited, and and that's what I'm talking about: spiritual technology. These beings uh, exist along that vibration continuum. They have, they have. Uh, some of them have full use of creational energy. They're they're beyond our imagination and things that they can do. Okay, there there, there you go. Um, <clears throat> but that's that personal journey that you just described, um, mm -hmm. uh, Joshua Ben Joseph having, mm -hmm. um, was possible for or is possible for anybody uh, if they first realize exactly um, that. Hold on a second. Um, yeah, uh, I have a lot of anger, or I have a lot of jealousy, or I have a lot of resentments, um, and I need to first look at that. Um, <clears throat> what's what's the old saying? Don't look at the splinter in your brother's eye. First, look at the plank in your own. Uh -huh. So, but, yeah, so yeah, exactly. That that's what happens, and and basically, each one of those attitudes and emotions. You know, what we do is we help people process the wounds and traumas and wrong conclusions from past experiences. And, and clean up that those those uh, experiences. And once you do that, because you know, like anger, jealousy, greed. Uh, uh, oh, I'm trying to think of the other all the you know unworthiness, all of that stuff. You know, a lot of that unfortunately is taught in the major religions. You know, the separation game and un, you know guilt and unworthiness and fear are the biggest ones. And you have to drop that. You have to dump that. Because those are very low frequency thoughts, and they're holding your energy down, holding your vibration down. And so, the more you release this, you know, the fear and the ignorance and ignorance and the guilt and the un unworthiness. The more you release that, the higher your frequency goes up, and you can experience more of yourself, of your true self. And and that's a lot of what we do. And and it has to do with contact as well. Uh, you know, the the more we release. And the closer we get to enlightenment, the more we're going to have contact with these amazing beings. Okay. Um, if you could, could you give a brief sort of overview um, for how the separation game is installed into the mind and energy body um, and the emotional body of a human being? Mm -hmm. so pr probably a lot of people out there don't realize that it has been installed, and it's like a mind. It's like a virus that has has caused the separation, and we don't even know that things are possible because we just don't know, and we don't know, we don't know. Could you give yeah. sort of an overview of how it's done, and then we'll move on from that? Well, you know, you see kids when they're first born. You know, at the age of two to four, they see the other dimension. They you know, they point at beings and they'll laugh and sometimes they get scared because some of these beings aren't so friendly. And, uh, you know, they, that's pretty normal. That's our normal state. And, and that's why Yeshua said you must become like a child before you can enter the kingdom of heaven. You've got to get back to that innocence and that openness to be able to experience these other dimensions. But the, uh, uh, the basic, the, the inspiration comes through school. It, it's amazing. It comes through uh, competition, you know, getting people to start competition, thinking they're separate beings, you know, not cooperating, not working together. You know, all these programs, you know, all the way through school, even in the curriculum, you know, you're competing. You get an A, you get a B, you get a C. You're, you got a C, you're just, you're just 
sick, you know, whatever, you know, you got an A, you're good, you got a D, you're bad, you know. Uh, you know, all these judgment programs and, and division programs are, are installed by social consciousness. And, and it's a very demeaning uh, uh, process that continues all the way through throughout society, you know. And, and uh, you know, they, they drug and lock up people that are uh, seers, you know, that have these abilities that aren't fitting in with the status quo, that can see how how uh, controlling and screwed up it is. And, and it just goes on from there. And now, you know, today, you look at the fluoride in the water, which totally shuts down your, your pineal gland. Uh, you know, they've got chlorine in there. When you, when you brush your, t your teeth, you know, you're actually getting chloroform. That's why people get high. <laughs> you know, when they brush their teeth, you feel a little bit of high. Uh, there's, there's like something like 800 toxins. Uh, you know, I can go on and on. All the food additives, you know, aspartame, even corn syrup, all of these things are just, you know, logging you down. You know, they're just like knocking you down. And and lately, their 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 greatest uh, invention now is the chemtrails, where they're spraying heavy metals such as aluminum, uh, barium, and and strontium. You know, another nice radioactive material uh, in the the in the aerosol spraying program and. And, you know, I can go deeper into that, but we have to look at the effects of this. Like, aluminum is a poison. That's the bottom line. These heavy metals are poisons, you know. Aluminum blocks the intake of, of plants, like trees and, and plants, to bring water up. It actually blocks it. It's a wholesale salt on, on nature and, you know, our crops, everything. It's just unbelievable. You know, barium is, a, is they use it in chemical warfare to create all the, the flu-like symptoms, you know, the gastrointestinal problems, the upper respiratory, the, you know, the aches and pains and joint pain and muscle pain and everything else. It's a very, very uh, uh, toxic material. And strontium, you know, we all know what, what happens when you introduce, you know, a strong kind of radioactive material into the process. So. So anyway, these people are dumping billions of tons of this on us daily, and it's one of the biggest cover-ups I've ever seen, and nobody will talk about it. And the there, reason nobody will was, talk about it is because... Go ahead. Uh, there was a scene in passing a documentary done very recently uh, by the name of... Mm -hmm. What in the world are they spraying, or something like that, chemtrails? Yeah, what on earth are they spraying? Yeah, that for anyone interested in chemtrails, I would suggest that you go and watch that. Um, at G. Edward Griffith, try to keep, try to. I think they they try to keep um, as close to, uh, if not absolutely on factual detail, with no speculation and no no um, jumping to conclusions, etc. Just presenting the facts and the startle and the effects of the aluminium uh, in the soil um, through various parts of the U.S. where they did the studies. Um, longitudinal studies <coughs> where the the aluminium changed the pH value of the soil to such an extent that all indigenous plant and fauna would just die off. Um, and mm -hmm. was, I, be I believe then another piece of information that I got, an unnamed company um, uh, I think has a patent on a aluminium resistant seed. Um, in 2009 it was the, the, the received the patent. Now, uh, yeah. that, could be coincid that could be coincidence, I don't know, but yeah, so if you want to go into chemtrail, um, the aerosol um, uh, program that they sell, um, go into that a little bit for anyone who maybe has looked up in the sky and wondered, what are all those quite streaky things up there and why are they all sort of joining together and they look like clouds but they're not really clouds and why is the weather all screwed up? Mm -hmm. Do you want to go into yeah, that a little bit? Yeah, exactly. You know, and you can go to Clifford Carnicom's site or William Thomas. They have really good sites, and there's a lot of disinformation sites out there as usual. But uh, the bottom line is, it's happening. The measurements they're getting, you know, there's six thousand times more uh, of these heavy metals in the snowpacks than than are beyond hazardous levels. So, I mean, whoever's behind this, it's the most insane program I have ever seen in my life, and it has no civilian oversight whatsoever, and not one person will talk about it, other than 
there was two senators who actually tried to write a bill to stop it and expose it. Uh, he was the only one that I've seen so far, a politician, that actually addressed this issue, and it got shot down almost immediately. But, you know, all of the patents, all of the programs and everything, and you just type in aerosol spraying program, or, or there's another word for it that has all of that information there, and you'll be shocked to see how many agencies are involved in this in this process. Now, they're saying it's all to stop global warming. The problem is, is that the planet's cooling down, and the planet has been cooling down for some time. So, so basically, that that program is is not the reason for doing it. I think it was a a cell factor on how they got you know the the mega corporations got to buy and and got all of us to pay for it. But uh, the real what the real effects of this is just beyond imagination. It's I you know I I can't even you know, scream loud enough to tell people we've got to wake up on this one because it's it's genocide, basically. That's the only way I can say it. You know, what's, it's not just genocide to people. It's genocide to nature itself. Okay, let's let's play devil's advocate um, for a moment and say that some somebody somewhere with vast resources has decided um, in their wisdom to um, implement a program such as the aerosol spraying program to somehow uh, slow down or retard the so-called global warming and again the intent is mm -hmm. to help the earth now if very quickly the results and the findings and the statistics come back saying that the the um, the results of doing this program is having a severely detrimental effect on the whole biosphere and humanity. Yeah, it definitely is. Uh, um, I mean, that's true. So let's let's yeah, just say that they have they have received that. Then why would they again play in devil's advocate? Why would they go on with such a program when they know that it it shuts down the immune system, um, it affects all the bodily functions, um, it's going to kill off all the indigenous. Um, plant and fauna life and indeed um, destroy crops mm -hmm. um, what what reason can they can they give when the, f the feedback and when the results are s clearly shown now guys this isn't good mm -hmm. you know, yeah basically yeah here's the way it works and and people need to understand this basically all the republics that were created you know to serve you know buying of the people are gone basically and now what we have is corporate dictatorial democracies and, and they own the politicians, and they the politicians will do what they're told. You know, they don't get in office without this corporate funding. You know, that's the bottom line. And when you have millions and millions of dollars, probably billions of dollars in these programs that they're going to be making, uh, these mega corporations are soulless. They they care nothing about humanity and the earth. They all they care about is profit, and they're going to push it through just for that profit. And, and that is the really sad situation that we have on the planet right now is that the majority of the planet is governed by these soulless corporations and at the top of these soulless corporations are some very soul soulless men. And, and I actually think these soulless men are actually being guided by other forces that are unseen that are, that are, are very, very negative. They actually feed off of the pain and suffering of the people and, and would like to see the majority of us gone. You know, so that's the only thing that makes sense because this, when you look at all the evidence and what's happening there, you can't deny the evidence. I mean, the, the metals are there, and you see them being sprayed. There's no way they could get to these mountaintops. I mean, nobody's run up there with bags of aluminum and spread them around on the mountaintops. You know, it, it doesn't happen that way. So you look at all the evidence, and it all points to a huge global faction that is behind this. And that global faction points to the major corporations and just a few individuals. And I think those individuals are are totally possessed. I think they have no uh, they they have no respect for humanity whatsoever. And also, most of humanity have become the enemy because when humanity awakens to what they've done and and what they've been doing, then there's going to be, you know, hell to pay, basically, and they know that, and they, they know a great reckoning is coming, so basically the majority of humanity has now become the enemy to
to these, these certain elite individuals that have just run amok for so long on here. Okay. James, time for a quick break. Um, folks, we'll be right back with James Gilliland uh, with Enlightened Contact with Extraterrestrial Intelligence. Um, hold that thought. We'll be right back. You're listening to the Irish Side of the Moon. You can hear our new episodes every Monday on radiomedia.org and irishsideofthemoon.blogspot.com. You can also download episodes from iTunes, Stitcher, and many other sites. You can follow us on Twitter, you can join our Facebook group, and if you're already in the group, don't forget to invite your friends. If you have any ideas for future guests on the show, send an email to shane at the irishsideofthemoon.ie. We are Irish Side of the Moon. Freedom of information, personal empowerment. And folks, you're welcome back. Um, speaking with James Gilliland. No, just before the break, we were talking about how the corporations and the soulless corporations have um, installed themselves in places of power. James, would you like to expand on this idea? Now, it's been put forward by many social commentators, many researchers. Um, mm -hmm. Can you give your angle to how and what is actually happening here on our planet? Well, well, basically, you know, what we're seeing here is just reckless greed. I mean, everything boils down to reckless greed by just a small group of people. But, you know, humanity has its part to play in that, too, because, you know, in ignorance, they, they, they are actually becoming willing participants in these programs that are extremely harmful to humanity and the Earth. You know, a good example is, is, you know, these nuclear facilities. Uh, you know, the higher beings have been screaming, don't go there, do not play with this energy. It's a very deadly energy. You can't get rid of it. You can't deal with the waste. Uh, you should not be using nuclear energy, you know. And, and they've been screaming, get rid of your nuclear weapons. You know, they're... It's a no win. There's nobody that's going to win a nuclear war. Nobody wins. The whole planet goes down. So, you know, basically they've, they've been very adamant about this, but, you know, these mega corporations and their bot scientists and, you know, their PR spin doctors out there keep selling us this, this nonsense. And they keep building these. And, and, you know, it's on the books right now. They want to build the exact same reactors in Texas right now by the exact same people that are that, that are in charge of this huge nuclear meltdown in Japan. And and when you look at that, you go, well, that's unimaginable. But they're still pushing to get this through. Why why would they be pushing to get this through? The same thing with the Gulf Oil. I mean, they totally killed you know an ocean there, and and and. The core exit and all the other stuff they dumped in there is still there. And people are dying, dropping like flies. And they're trying to say it's a flu or whatever. You know, they're trying to call it something else, but it's a direct result of the, the things they sprayed there and the bacteria that they sprayed there that are attack carbon-based life forms. Well, guess what? We are a carbon-based life form, and when that bacteria gets in our system, it takes it attacks us and it takes us out. So, so you know, it's. The, the insanity behind this, what they're doing, and now they just said, yeah, go for it, start drilling, you know, drill some more wells out there. You know, we, we didn't totally finish off the ocean. We want to, we, we got to get in there and, uh, and, and totally destroy it. Uh, you know, it, it's just pure insanity. Uh, you know, and if people haven't figured this out yet by what is being shown to them, uh, and that they keep ex ask, thinking that some angelic master or ET is going to come down here and fix all this for them, you know, they're, they're off the rocker because, you know, they've been told over and over, they've been warned about this, they continue to support it, be willing participants in it, you know, even pay for it, and uh, they're allowing themselves to be led by these psychopaths down this social, economic, and environmental uh, collapse, and and as long as the people are, are not going to rise up and wake up and figure out what's going on, that's part of their lesson. It's part of their evolution. So, you know, I feel like if enough people figure it out and wake up and start asking for help and and start acting on this, uh, then the help is going to come in, and and all of this can be easily cleaned up. Okay, before we get get into the how people 
um, can tune in and ask for help, i.e. use their use their free will properly. Um, can I talk more about um, I think tsunamis and the oh, yeah. the Japanese nuclear um, mm -hmm. problem right now? What's what's happening there? From from your perspective, from yeah. your picture, I'll tell you from my perspective what I've seen there is, is basically there's a lot of things happening that people aren't seeing behind the scenes. And one is there was a, a major harp signature there. The cloud formations were there, and there was a, a major heating in the upper ionosphere, and it was all measured. So so everything that would point to a harp event was being used there. And for those who don't know what HARP is, it's, it's actually uh, a facility that has all kinds of capa capabilities. It can redirect weather. Uh, you can do weather wars in it, weather modification. It can create earthquakes. It can activate volcanoes. Uh, it can sedate people or throw you into fits of rage. You know, it, it's, it's an amazing facility with a lot of abilities. And you know, Bruce Agnew, who's a good friend of mine, has talked a lot about that as well as, as um, uh, uh, Nick Bajic, you know, who's, who's over there in Alaska. They wrote books about it and talked about all the capabilities and how they're using these, these weapons. And, and so that's one thing we need to factor in there uh, and take a good look at that. Now, the other factor is, is that Japan, in their parliament there, they were having talks about 911, how it was an, an inside job. Uh, who was behind it, you know, they brought out all the evidence and they said it's undeniable that that this whole thing was orchestrated and and that, that's a major uh, thorn in the side of the controllers of the New World Order boys, you know, they don't want that coming out. And, and they also said, you know, screw you to the banksters basically that were taking over their entire monetary system. Uh, and they said, no, it's not going to happen. So they had a couple lessons on that agenda, you know, that arena as well. And then there's another thing going on there, too, is that they're coming out with all these magnetic motors and water cars and all this incredible technology there, which is another big thorn in those who want to keep us enslaved through dependency. So when you factor that in together, and, and it's a much bigger picture than, than even just this. I mean, this sounds like conspiracy thing, but I'm just giving you the facts, and you can make up your own decision. So, so basically, we also had the ninth wave that the Mayans talk about hit March 9th, and, and I went on record and told a lot of people, including friends over there in Japan that are helping people right now, that this event was going to unfold, and, and I said, you know, it's coming in right after the ninth, uh, and, and so... So basically this huge gravitic wave came through on March 9th. It's called Unity Consciousness Wave. It's, it's a time compression wave that, that's going to speed things up very fast. Uh, and then we also had some major uh, uh, coronal mass ejections and flares at the same time, which also set off earthquakes and volcanoes. And it's an opportune time to use your other toys, you know, to set something off wherever you want it uh, to, to fit your agenda. So a lot of different things happened there all at once to set that scenario into play. And, and I have a feeling there was also some major interven intervention because the powers that be wanted Japan to be underneath the ocean. Basically, that was their plan to make it go away completely. So, so that's, that's one thing going on. Now, we have another thing there, too, is that the reactors, basically, again, we have these mega corporations, you know, building these massive facilities, and they're, they're scientists and spin doctors selling them to the people, and we didn't learn a thing from Chernobyl or, or a lot of the other problems that we're experiencing, and, and the majority of the reactors around the world right now are leaking, and they're having serious problems, and they're keeping them running. And, and I know Germany, I know, has shut down their reactors. Uh, I think uh, India has shut down most of their nuclear reactors. They said that, you know, these things are not safe. We need to take another look at it. And a lot of other countries are, are actually shutting down their reactors. But over in the United States, we're going to start building new ones and the exact same reactors that, that went awry there in Japan. And, and they have all their 
corporate scientists, you know, and bot scientists saying, oh, it's all under control. You know, we've got a triple safety feature that uh, there's no way any nuclear waste will will escape, and there's no problem whatsoever. And, and they're, they're explaining this all this high science, you know, to everybody saying how safe and everything else. is the problem is that reality is not matching their spin job and their sell job. And, and these things are not safe. There's no way of making them safe. And we shouldn't be using that technology in any way whatsoever. And, and so, you know, people go, well, what, what are you going to do without power? Well, the problem is that Japan is coming out with the answer. And uh, that's pretty much why they might have been taken out, because we do have fuelless energy technologies and ways of generating enormous amounts of energy, more than we'd ever need. We have anti-gravity and counter-gravity both. And all of that is tied up in the black projects, you know, that the elite control. So, so there's your solution right there uh, for these things. Is we need to, you know, unplug these these nuclear facilities and you know keep the turbines and everything else, and and use these other technologies to to spin the turbines and generate, you know, the the power that we need. Okay. Okay. That's. That's a good summation. Um, a question popped into my head there when you were when you were talking near the end about um, energy solutions. Um, Tesla was he from only here on this planet, or do you think that maybe he was maybe from somewhere else? I you know I feel his soul was definitely off the world because because he was definitely plugged into some higher force and. You know, he was the one that gave us all these technologies, and, and but his focus was to use them for good. And unfortunately, again, as I said, almost all the top scientists end up going into the military, war industry, or the mega corporations. And their their whole program is to enslave people through dependency, make the biggest profit possible, or, or use these technologies to control and dominate and break things. I mean, that's. That's that's the big problem we're, we're experiencing on the Earth right now, and they are using his technologies. Uh, they've they've you know expanded on them, and and actually Hark uh, is part of that technology. You know he had a vehicle that he drove from coast to coast uh, on one little fuel cell, and and then all of a sudden you know that car just kind of vanished and and. Uh, and when, was he in the twenties? I can't remember when was Tesla. Tesla was from eighteen, sort of the eighteen eighties. Uh, his his main his main sort of uh, inspirational period was um, from nineteen ten right through to nineteen thirty. He came out with all sorts of good stuff. Yeah, yeah. So, so I mean, we had these technologies back in the twenties, and yeah. and you know, in the thirties, uh, Germany started doing some crash retrievals, and, and also had this technology and they started building, you know, their back engineered ships and things with these technologies. So so, you know, they've had it since the thirties and you know, they even had a nuclear weapon back then, but they actually decided not to use it. They said it was just too dangerous. Uh, you know, it could backfire on all humanity and they decided not to use it. So what do we do? We go over there and steal all the technology, hide it, you know, back engineer it and then Keep it, you know, from the people. All the, the good, the you know, the good uses of it are, are withheld from the people, and then we use it to, you know, drop a couple bombs on Japan and 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 blow off. Uh, you know, the same guys that were blowing off nukes in the atmosphere and poisoning the entire Earth with radiation are the same guys that developed this chemtrail program. <laughs> yeah, it's Teller. It, this guy Teller, who was known for he, they just love letting off nukes. You know, that was his. You know, it was like psychopaths with big firecrackers. You know, it uh, and and with no oversight, no civilian oversight, and that's the problem we have today right now. No civilian oversight. None of the agencies have any teeth, and they have no backing. And and uh, and these guys are just running amok. Yeah, to date, I think um, there has been since the dropping of the first two, there has been something like three thousand known nuclear de detonations on planet Earth. Now that's a hell of a lot of radiation over a short period of time. 
Yeah, that might you know, kind of skew you into why we have all the cattle mutilations right now. You know, because okay. basically the cows, you know, where are they, what are they going after? They're going after reproductive systems on the cows, you know, and they're trying to find out how much of, of an environmental impact all of this radiation and all these chemicals and every, all these other things that we're doing to the planet you know, that's why they're snagging these cows. And that's a joint effort with some low-level ETs and our own government doing that one. Okay, that sounds like a good segue into the next <laughs> segment. Um, so let, let me recap. The, the problems that uh, we are facing uh, as a race or as a number of races possibly on this planet um, is greed, um, anger, lust, Procrastination, sloth, all the usual, um, insanity, um, yeah. possibly, possibly being um, ushered and prompted by other entities that can feed off all the byproducts of those uh, um, processes. Um, mm -hmm. We have individuals. Um, the only way out of it is to start to look at yourself before you. Um, point and blame anything on the outside so that's just sort of me recapping of what what we've gone over here yeah there's uh, one thing one thing i'd like to add to and this this might upset a lot of people but uh, a lot of the new age teachings have actually been funded by uh, certain alphabet agencies and there's a book called stargate uh, conspiracies that covers this whole thing and and one of the things that they push very hard and I'm not saying I think the new age is wonderful I consider myself part of it but there's some real fallacies that have been interjected into this and one of them is that you know the negative doesn't exist and if you see it it's in you and you're creating it by looking at it or addressing it and so you're supposed to live in complete denial of it and uh, act as if it doesn't exist whatsoever and, and that gives these forces total uh, rain, uh, unchecked rain to do whatever they want. And, and I think we need to take a hard look at that one and say, wait a second, wait a second. Uh, you know, I didn't build these nuclear reactors. You know, I didn't build these, these uh, atomic bombs. Uh, but, you know, maybe the part of me that was very ignorant and paid my taxes, which, which that's where it went, and I wasn't paying attention. Okay, I'll take responsibility for the ignorance of allowing this to go on but uh, you know the others have to take responsibility for creating you know this nonsense and so it's a matter of, of accountability and responsibility and having the courage and the integrity to do what's right and you know and 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 actually standing up to this nonsense it, it's pure insanity and, and if we want to let the, the leadership take us in the downward spiral to total social, economic, and environmental collapse and, and be willing participants in that, then we have, you know, the reaction to that or that experience. And if, and if we want to stand in our courage and wake up and just say, hey, this is wrong, this is not right, you know, we shouldn't be building these things, uh, then you know, I think that's a much <clears throat> better path. And, and one more thing, you know, these these corporate scientists that are coming on and saying, you know, nothing's wrong, uh, this is all contained, nothing's going to happen, don't worry about anything. You know, my, my talk to them is that I think we should buy them all a first-class ticket to, you know, Fukushima and have them all hold hands and talk about it, you know, around the reactors there and then, and then maybe take all that nuclear waste and the meltdown material and just dump it in there in their uh, mansions, you know, in their backyards, you know, just let them figure out what to do with it. And and that would solve the problem right away. Sounds like a solid plan. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Yeah, and if, it does, and, you know, and, it, and if all this stuff doesn't exist and the people say none of this is happening, it's all your imagination, it's all illusion, you know, get them a ticket there too, you know, <laughs> because it is happening. And we do have physical bodies and we live on a physical planet and we need, and this 3D reality called Earth is just as godly as any other reality. Okay, okay. Um, moving on swiftly, um, just like some of the craft, can you, can you get into uh, the, some of the weird and wonderful things that you began to 
encounter um, at or around the ranch and bring us through uh, I suppose from start and how it progressed and how you and your you know, your friends there um, did your work to aid in that contact? Well, basically, the, the first contact came, you know, in the 25 years. I think it was right around the 10-year period when I was here. And I was doing, you know, I was meditating three times a day and, and really working on cleaning up my own act, basically. And what happened was... Uh, I was in an all-day meditation, and I was like halfway through it, and, and uh, all of a sudden I started hearing, you know, a telepathic message coming to me, uh, very loving, you know, very concerned, you know, very loving, and, you know, it sounded like you're talking to a master, like an angelic master or something like that, and, uh, you know, they were talking about, you know, how much they love me, and I could feel the energy coursing through my body, and, and uh and they were talking how much they love humanity Earth and how they're extremely concerned with where we're going and, you know, how we need to clean up our consciousness and clean up our environment and, and bring back Eden, basically. That was their message. And and so I was trying to find out where they, who they were and where they were coming from. And, and when I asked them, you know, who are you? Like, where are you coming from? They said, we're actually fifth-dimensional beings. And, and uh, they said that, uh, we're actually coming from a ship, and, and that's that's when I felt I totally lost it. You know, my imagination had run amok, and I broke off the meditation. I went outside to, to plant some trees, and my sisters and some of their friends came running up. I didn't even make it to the door, and they're banging on the door, and they go, "Do you see it? Do you see it?" And I said, "See what?" And they said, "There was a ship hovering over the house." So, so that was my first encounter. Uh, with these beings, uh, the, that I had to realize that there are these extremely spiritually and technologically advanced beings that many of us would think they were angelic or, or masters, you know, uh, you know, because of our program, but, I mean, there's a whole universe of these beings out there, a multiverse of them, and they're, they're coming in now to assist humanity and the earth in this major birthing process we're undergoing. And okay, so you thought you lost it, but obviously, you didn't. <laughs> yeah, yeah, right. Uh, okay, can, for my own benefit, wh- what what aided you in um, referencing for yourself that hey, listen, I haven't actually lost it. Um, in fact, I'm just gaining it now for the first time. What what was useful for you um, at that time? Well, basically, what was happening is that. In engaging that higher consciousness and energy, it was putting me through a transformational process. You know, where I did have to go deeper and deeper into myself and and start healing any old wounds and traumas and wrong conclusions from past experiences. And and uh, <clears throat> and so that continued for quite some time, and it was kind of like a preparation process. And they told me to stop looking outside for them. Uh, if I continued to look outside of my outer senses for them, that it would interfere in the process. And, and they said if I continued to go within and do my spiritual practices, that they would continue to uh, appear to me. But they said, but don't, don't keep focusing on the outer. You know, it's an inner thing. And so, so basically I did. And the more I did my inner work, the more they would actually show up and appear and show us their ships, and, and a lot of people witnessing this, you know, as it was ongoing. So it was nice to have that uh, that support system there with, with uh, and so I was having all these phenomenal inner connections and telepathic messages and everything else going on where other people were actually seeing the ships, you know, to validate it. Okay, and at any time did the, um, did the entity um, or being that first showed up when you were five and give you the ice cream like um, mm-hmm. medicine have you ever encountered that same being I, I have actually she's appeared here at the ranch and we've, got, we've actually photographed her and it was Mary okay okay um, okay so that was the next sort of phase and 
yeah well it there seems to life's just a, a journey um yeah well that's that's what i do is i tie it all together because what's happened in our past we had a lot of events that we experienced that were recorded and if you go into all the ancient vedic scriptures you know, they talk about over 400,000 humanoid beings exist, you know, in the universe. And they talk about their ships, the types of ships they have. They say some ships are physical, some are energy ships, some are, are magnetized light ships, and some are Merkabahs. You know, they're just uh, spiritual vehicles that these beings create. And they cover all of that. They even talk about the weapons and the armaments on these ships and great battles between these ships in the ancient past. So there's a long history. Now, when you get into the Bible, you'll see frescoes all over Europe with UFOs in them. And and you have to ask yourself, you know, here's Jesus being baptized. Here's Mary praying with this big golden ship sending the beam down to her third eye, basically. And and these are all over all over Europe, these frescoes. And it wasn't until the 50s where all this started being, uh, you know, poo-pooed and... and put down and, and made to look uh, like you're crazy in a major psyop process because that's when, you know, they started back engineering all these these uh, ships and, and technologies and they didn't want people to even look towards UFOs or look at them. They just wanted to, to keep everybody stupid and dumbed down and, and looking like they're crazy. And what a wonderful job they've done. <laughs> yeah, they've done a great job on that one. Yeah. You know, now now you're you're dealing with the you know before you're dealing with the angels and masters and, and Yeshua Ben Joseph and all these guys. You know, you you were the more you got into this and and studied it, and uh, you know you would tie this into the higher beings and and the masters and everything else. Nowadays, uh, if you do that, you know, according to a lot of Christianities, you're you're dealing with the devil. You know, you're dancing with the devil because. Because a lot of times now they have two uh, two categories. It's either God or it's devil, and everything they don't understand and haven't done the research on goes into the devil category, and and uh, and you know through fear and 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 all this other nonsense, they they keep the pressure of the real knowledge down. Okay, you mentioned God and the devil. <clears throat> um, mm-hmm. Let's just focus on God for a, a moment. Um, co- Doing a bit of research for here, I came across an interview you, you did, and you you described God uh, in a very beautiful way, and you mm-hmm. unpicked some of the misperceptions and the indeed the, the the conceptions that different peoples have of when they say the word God. Um, and I thought it was really really nice. Could you um, again go into that a little bit? Um, mm-hmm. Give people a different view, give them a different picture of, um, so that they can hold within themselves a new view of God, a more, uh, a more panoramic mm-hmm. view of God. Yeah, definitely. My, what I'm talking from is my own experience, and a lot of people have had other experiences out there, and so basically all I can do is share with you my own experience, but when I had the drowning experience, I went through a tunnel, and that, and I, I moved very fast through this tunnel, and I saw all these levels, all these different levels, uh, like planes and dimensions, as I was moving through them, and you know, because of other programming, it seems like other spiritual programming I had or whatever, I I didn't stop to talk. If you see friends and relatives, you know, and you're going through the tunnel or whatever, don't stop. <laughs> Keep going. And, and I ended up in this golden white light, this, and it was the most loving, joyous, blissful, non-judging energy you can experience. There's really no words for it. And, uh, and what I realized, I had a conversation, you know, with this, this consciousness and energy. And so when you're there, you're in your light body. So you're, you're unique, but you're one with this other light and this other consciousness and energy. So you're, you're unique, yet one at the same time, which sounds like a paradox, but it's not. And uh, and so I was having a conversation, you know, with this, this the most loving, joyous, blissful energy you can imagine. And, uh, 
And the first thing I asked was, how can I stay? And and there's a transmission came back to me, and it just said, you know, I, I, I never told one of my children when to come or go. That's free will. And, and I go, well, wait a second, you know, that doesn't add up with my Catholic background, you know, that I was taught, you know. So, so the next thing I asked was, how can I serve, you know, how can I, you know, what can I do? And, uh, you know, how can I earn the right to stay? And it came back to me and it, and it said, you know, you know, basically that's free will, you know. He, he said, uh, it made it very clear. I don't even want to say he because there wasn't a he to it. But, um, but the message I got back was basically, uh, you know, I didn't, I didn't, basically, you know, that's free will. I didn't tell them, you know, when you could come and when you could go or anything. That's, that's your choice. And so, so I, the last thing I said, how can I earn the right to stay? And it came back to me and it said, you cannot earn what is given freely and unconditionally. And I, and I go, wow, this is not, you know, at all the image I was given, you know. So, so for, for a while there, I was just floating in this energy, and they call it being held in the cradle of, of God or whatever, in the arms of God, and I was just so secure, so feeling just pure bliss and love, and, and I asked, how can I serve? What can I give back? And there was no answer for a while, and then finally it came back to me, and all it said was, what brings you joy? And I thought about it for a while, and then I said, I really want to return. I want to return to the earth and teach people uh, the true nature of, of God or the source and what it really is. And uh, and so basically, the last words I heard were, as you wish, and I was back in the body and they are pulling me out of the water. And and from that experience, I realized is that the source is just this pure, loving, joyous, non-judging being and that just wants us to be happy, basically. You know, that's the bottom line. And, and do what brings us joy. And the more we do that, the more we're in love and joy and bliss, of course, we are to the source. And that, that is the teaching. You know, that's, that's the bottom line. And that's what almost every master on the planet is taught. And, and those teachings have been just totally twisted and used and abused by, you know, kings and institutions since then. So you got, whether accidentally or not, um, a full understanding of what free will is really about through your mm -hmm. near-death experience. Okay, so the old... The exactly, old and I, I realize, too, yeah, that there isn't a little old man up there with lightning bolts and a, and a book. You know, it doesn't work that way. You know, we create our own punishment because of choices and actions and our beliefs. You know, we... You know, in this action-reaction world, they call it plane of demonstration. You know, this 3D reality we're in right now. We're at the helm, and we're creating our own reality. You know, there's there are influences, both good and bad, on us. But ultimately, we make the choice on on where we go, and and every action has a reaction. And and so it, it's not. It's just built into this system. But uh, it's not this this being up there. Uh, you know, passing judgment, throwing lightning bolts at people, you know, and punishing people. It's just, it doesn't work that way. It's, it's uh, you know, we create our own punishments. Wow. Um, karma. Um, a quick, yeah. a quick 101 on karma. Now there's, again, people have uh, various mm -hmm. concepts um, such as you know when they, when you, when you say the word God it, it's it's like a it's, it becomes a noun and karma has become a noun and there's various yeah. different types types of karma again from your experience you can only share from your own experience what what is um mm -hmm. what is karma and how does it play out in one lifetime and maybe how does it play out in multiple lifetimes I. The way I experience it is, you know, even Yeshua Ben Joseph talked about that. You know, he he said there's a couple things, you know, where he said, as you sow, so shall you really reap. And, and uh, you know, Buddha said a fool in his mischief is like fresh milk. You know, it takes a little time to spoil, but it will catch up. You know, so so basically, you know, that is in every tradition they talk about. You know, this these experiences. You know, but the uh, uh, it definitely is, it is at play, uh, 
you know, I, I call it more like action reaction. And we hold uh, memories in our astral body of all the different lives that we've that we've experienced, and some of those lives weren't uh, in the highest and best good of humanity, Earth, and they do carry with them an energy, you know, uh, some guilt and and some lessons that come with that, and and it's definitely at play on many levels. You know, I'm some really good, wonderful people out there having some horrendous things happen to them. And, and a lot of it is, is because of, of other lifetimes that, you know, have happened. And, and sometimes it's just a matter of other lifetimes not standing up for themselves. You know, again and again and again, so the lesson comes back to them again and again and again until they finally stand up for themselves and say enough's enough. So there, there's so many different things unfolding. I always say, you know, there's no way you can judge any event because nobody knows, you know, what a soul needs for completion. You know, they don't know, you know, what's going on on the big picture or what these souls have done in other lifetimes and things like that. So on this level, when we see events unfolding, sometimes they don't make sense at all. But when you see the books and you see the higher levels of what's going on, it makes perfect sense. Okay. Okay. It gives... Uh Karma is, can be can be simple or it can be complex or it can be both um, mm -hmm. action reaction and again it's down to choice and free will <clears throat> um, there's something about free will now that I'm talking to you um, that I don't know can we expand upon it um, to have full impact um, to people listening mm -hmm. to everyone listening every person has the ability to engage with their free will. Um, I'm just wondering what's the right question to ask because there's something very important about free will um, in the ultimate sense of free will um, mm -hmm. as opposed to, yeah, as opposed yeah, to what's, been taught, yeah. what's been taught. Um, what's the right question? What do I need well, to ask? You know, the way I see it is will. Yeah, yeah, there's different levels of will and, and that's the way and each level is just important. So, so basically the way I see it is we make choices. And, and a lot of us, you know, unfortunately won't hold God or the devil, you know, accountable, responsible for the choices that we make. Or we hold others or blame others. But, you know, in each case we make a choice, and that choice has consequences, you know, either good or bad. You know, I don't even like to use the word good or bad. You know, either lessons or no lessons. I don't know. Whatever word you want to use. But... But uh, uh, on, on one level, you know, on a soul level, we, we choose to come in and finish unfinished business and gain wisdom through experience and, and uh, kind of clean up our past, basically. And, uh, and so we've made a choice on that level. On, as a personality down here, we may not be aware of that choice that we made. And so we may seem like victims or, uh, or you know, or, or uh, like somebody's punishing us or whatever. And, and so that's the whole key. It all goes back to, you know, the awakening and healing process. Take responsibility, you know, and stop giving, you know, making other things outside of yourself accountable for your experiences. Are you going to go within and ferret out these old wounds and traumas and, and gain the wisdom from these experiences and let them settle in the soul so they're no longer necessary? You know, or are you going to be a victim and... Uh, and, and or continue to persist, you know, participate in actions that are harmful to humanity and the earth just for that buck, you know, that almighty dollar. Uh, all of these things are creating your reality, and, and we have a, a choice as to whether we are going to awaken and heal this on every level, or are we going to continue uh, to play out this, I call it the victim, savior, persecutor triangle or wheel. And... Uh, and this wheel is spinning right now, and we're all jumping in as either saviors or victims or, or persecutors, you know, uh, of victims and, and taking different roles on this wheel. And eventually we need to step off this wheel completely and just let it play itself out and uh, focus on our own awakening and healing. Now, I'm going to ask you something, and you may have been asked this before it may not be possible um, could you take a little time um, to maybe tune in uh, and do a little healing meditation for a couple of minutes 
uh, online uh, on air right now would that be possible um, and f if anybody can join in and stop whatever they're doing um, obviously pull over in their cars we don't want that w could would that be possible James well you know it could but uh, I don't know it's kind of interesting I do a lot of these and actually I'm going to do one today uh, at seven o'clock tonight our time which is going to be a world healing meditation and actually focusing in on Japan and a little bit of a talk in the beginning to let people know what's going on but uh, you know, we do those here on a regular basis, uh, you know, so people can tune into that one tonight or uh, I think it's most important right now is that people learn to heal unseen negative influences. That is, is one of the most important things that I feel right now because, you know, we do have an emotional body and a mental body and although some of these entities, you can all discarnate spirits, you know, everybody has different names for them. Uh, they they don't have a physical body, but they still have a mental and emotional body. And sometimes people feel their emotions and their thoughts and act them out, and not even not even know where these feelings are coming from. So they'll they'll be feeling excessive fear or guilt or anger or a lot of these energies, and it may not even be their own. And and, and that's what we one of the things we teach here, even before teaching meditation is how to heal these unseen negative influences and keep your fields clear. And, and uh, that is one of the main problems, I think, on this planet is people are being influenced by, by other levels. And again, I don't want to support the victim program or anything else because we have a choice whether or not we act on these influences or attune to them. So, so you know, I think it's really important for us to tune to the highest consciousness and energy and keep healing these these the low-level energies, you know, the, the fear, the guilt, the unworthiness, all these other energies that are coming at us and, and, uh, and within us, and, uh, you know, to ascend to the highest level that we can attain, basically. Okay, and who's, or what group, or what, what l entities, or what, um, <coughs> what energies, there you go, what energies are good for people to um, sit and meditate on instead of sitting and ruminating on their on their problems and their mm -hmm. um, so-called afflictions, um, to sit and meditate, be it five minutes, twenty minutes, half an hour, um, where's a good starting point to tune in to a really loving energy, um, mm -hmm. and basically ask for a little help again, yeah, engage yeah. with the f the use of free will. I mean, mm -hmm. the, the, as Einstein said, the the solution is going to have to come from a different level that the problem was created in. So. Exactly. What's, what's, what's a good one to, to start with? Well, basically, you know, one of the lamas I study with, I love what he said. He, he said that, that basically, uh, he said the reason there's so few enlightened people on this planet, he says, because it's so damn simple. And it's not a huge mental construct or path with all of these names and images and the apps that you have to figure out. You know, he said, all you have to do is focus on love and joy and bliss until you become it. And he said, there lies the awakening. So, so on the premise of that, within each individual, there's this totally loving, joyous, wise, and powerful manifesting God or goddess, you know, waiting to unfold and come forward. And uh, that, you know, we've only attuned to maybe our, our personality self and our physical bodies, not realizing we have a spirit body in that body is connected straight into the source. So, so basically, you know, as all the masters said, you know, even Yeshua ben Joseph said, the temple is within, and and that you know, basically, God is within, and and the way I see it too is it's both. Basically, the the Creator is omnipresent within and without throughout all creation, but the way you access that is by going within and and doing your meditation time, and and so. I think the most powerful meditation is to begin by holding that image of this, this loving, joyous, powerful, manifesting God or goddess within, and, and know, know that the ultimate power is love and love serves. It's not like you're going to have power over others. It doesn't work that, that way. If you start using power over others, you've missed the mark, and you're going to have other entities jump in. You know, So as soon as you shift from service into 
into self-service and self-aggrandizement or the need for notoriety and things of that nature, then they've got you, you know. So you have to be very, very vigilant on that, you know, because there are both sides of the fence that want to jump in in this program. And, and uh, so it's, it's very important that, that people, you know, focus on, on, you know, service, you know, love, joy, bliss, and service, you know, as, as first priority. So, so you can also use other masters that have a long track record of this, you know, such as Yeshua ben Joseph or Jesus or Buddha, you know, Mary, if you want to connect to the divine feminine, there's all kinds of archetypes out there that represent this. And so depending on your culture, you can choose one of those archetypes. But okay, that helps so the main as well. Thing is, the main thing is just do it. Yeah. And you invite this in. Well, basically what I do is, I, first of all, I connect, I invite the higher beings in, and, and then I start out by healing, and, and I welcome all entities in love and light, you know, that are here for healing, and I tell them they're healed and forgiven, lifted and enlightened, and I tell them they're all filled and surrounded in the Christ light and the Christ love, and then I ask the beautiful many to escort them to their highest expression, their perfect place. And that clears your fields, you know, that takes these, these other entities off to wherever they need and, and heals them versus casting them out to go bother somebody else or come back later. And, and that clears your energy. And you do that till you feel really clear and you'll feel as you're doing this process is that you'll start expanding. You'll start feeling lighter and lighter and more energy coming in. And, and pretty soon you'll feel real clear when you do this process. And then it's best just to sit and and allow, don't try to stop thinking or stop the mind. You'll never do it. Uh, that'll drive you nuts. Just the thought of trying to stop thinking is still a thought. So, <laughs> so yeah, you allow it to run. You, you allow it to run. And you just keep focusing on that love and joy and bliss. You allow the mind to run. And it'll start, it'll run, it'll run out of gas, and then it'll move to the next level, and then it'll run out of gas and move to the next level. And you can just focus on the breath during this process, or just focus on a big golden ball of bliss or a candle or whatever, and just maintain that focus and let, let the mind just run. Let it run till it's done. And, and then eventually the mind just quiets down and settles in, and you're in this space where you're just uh, in this just pure love and joy and blissful state, and uh, uh, and that's basically the process. You know, it's a very simple process, but there are a lot of lot of techniques out there that people have invented. I would choose the most simple. Right. Yeah. And the goal is spacious, light, and clean. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. It, it's uh, you know, and 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 also too, you know, if you're having challenges and problems, you know, bring spirit into it, you know, rather than battle it on the ego level, walk away and go sit under a tree or something and say, hey, help me out with this, you know, I, I need some advice here and, and do that clearing process I've talked about and all of a sudden the answer will come and, and sometimes the problem just goes away by itself. Okay, but thank you, James. Um, uh, anyone listening? Everyone listening? Just... Go and go and do it. Um, because again, we're not gonna we're not gonna solve our problems at the same level we've created them. Um, I want to ask you about a creature. Now, this is sort of funny. A couple of days ago, myself and a friend were talking about um, the possibility of the uh, genetic uh, intervention of man through different various off-world species. And uh, my friend said, "Well, if they were so damn smart, why did they why did they mix?" The, the, the hominids with, with monkeys I mean would they not have been better mixing us with cats at least the, ki the cats would have kept the, the planet clean and I laughed <laughs> and then I was doing the research for you and then I seen Bagheet and I was like oh there you go um, <laughs> uh, that would have been a little better can you tell me a little background on, on Bagheet and, and your relationship is yeah. that been true I mean instead of sitting monkeys throwing their own uh, whatever at the wall uh, yeah. as, we, as, we do, as we do uh huh yeah, there are, uh, you know, in all the ancient traditions, uh, in India they call them Nashringa, and they were the feline beings, uh, and they were benevolent protectors of man. Uh, a lot of the villages would pray to them, and if bandits were coming to the village, they would start praying and bringing in Nashringa, and, 
and you'd see the bandits getting knocked off their horses by an invisible force and their clothing being torn and everything and they'd run off, you know, and that would be the end of it. Uh, but uh, that is one story, you know, that's been around for a long time. Now there's another story, uh, too, in, in ancient Egypt, they call them Sekhmet, or I think it's uh, Bost, or there's another one, but they're, they're feline, humanoid felines. One, one has the head of a lion and the body of a man or woman, and the other one has the head of a, more of a cat. And, and so, so these beings have been around forever. I mean, they, and, you know, they're not to be demonized. They're extremely loving beings, but they're, they're also very protective, uh, you know, and, and, you know, of those who have aligned themselves with them. So, so we've actually had these beings appear here. I've been in contact with one, and they're from Sirius, the Sirius system. And I've had contact with one that the first contact I had with her was I was going out of body, I was meditating, and I ended up on a ship with all of these people on the ship. And what I realized on this ship is not everybody was uh, humanoid as, as we know it. They were humanoid, but they weren't, you know, they didn't look like your neighbor, you might say. <laughs> and uh, some were blue, you know, had blue skin. Uh, some were wearing, you know, robes that, that but they had very tall beings, you know, with a, a blue tent to them that, you know, in the ancient days, we used to call, you know, some of the masters, Shiva and the other masters, had blue bodies or blue skin. And so it all ties in together. But, but what I did is I ended up on this ship, and I look at this beautiful blonde with her back to me, and I go, whoa, who's that? <laughs> you know, it's like, <laughs> you know, yeah, I was just looking at this beautiful silhouette, you know, and, and, uh, and she jumps up and spins around, and here I see this feline, uh, face, you know, and she runs up and gives me this big hug, like a long lost brother or something, and and it was it was amazing. I mean, I was just so filled with with love, and and she was just so happy to see me again, and and I didn't understand what that was about at first, and then I realized in my soul I've actually been there and, and experienced that that world and have been one of them in the past. So we've been all over the universe in our soul. We just don't remember because we're focused on, again, the body and the personality here. But uh, uh, we have family in the universe, and some of it doesn't look like us. I mean, it looks very different than we do. But that was my first experience, and I kept uh, a connection with her, like a telepathic contact and connection with her uh, for quite some time, for quite a few years. And, you know, I was blown away to see the uh, movie Avatar come out. And... And when I saw Avatar come out, I just said, oh, my God, like, like uh, you know, this, this is something that's going to change humanity. You know, there's some major divine intervention behind this one because, I mean, we had Bagheet's picture up there for years and years and years before, you know, that movie came out. But, uh, um, you know, not, not that I want anything for it. You know, I was trying to get, is it James yeah. Cameron, I think? I was trying to get him on the show, on, on one of my radio shows, to, to interview him, to say, hey, you know, where, where did you get that, that vision or that inspiration that, you know, it's been declined several times, but uh, I'd love to get him on the show, but I, mean, uh, I don't ask him for anything, like I don't want any credits or uh, uh, I'm not looking to sue anybody for copyright infringement, you know, we, don't even, we let everybody use the photos and pictures, but uh, the, uh, I'm just curious. I'm just really curious as where that inspiration came from to to bring out that movie. Well, maybe it being out there is just enough, right? What's that? Maybe it being out there is just enough. Yeah. Well, you know, I I think well, I I ran into some scientists that are actually working on some fuelless energy technologies and things of that nature, and they are having experiences with these beings and cooperating with them, but unfortunately they can't get their technologies out right now because of the powers that be out there, you know, the major oil companies and all these other companies are in conflict with that, you know, and they don't want people to have their own little, uh, you know, fearless energy generator that would provide all their needs and drive their cars and everything. They, that's the last thing they want to see. Okay, and you mentioned your radio shows um, for 
everyone listening, if they want to tune in and hear James Gilliland, um, where can they listen to you? Well, the two shows are, uh, it's As You Wish on BBS Radio. If they just go to bbsradio.com, uh, they can hear the, the As You Wish radio show, and it's 8 o'clock p.m. Pacific Standard Time over here in the U.S. And the other show is World Puja Network, and uh, the show is called Contact Has Begun, and it usually airs on Tuesdays, and then when it first airs, it's available, you know, to anybody for free, both these shows, but once they go in the archives, you'll have to join, you know, the network, and it's pretty reasonable. But what's nice is when you do join the network, you can listen to all the other past shows of myself and all the other guests as well. And and uh, I've had some just incredible. I just interviewed JJ Hurtak, and and uh, you know some pretty powerful guests come on on a regular basis. So it's definitely worth it. Okay, so BBS Radio, uh, as you wish, Talk Radio, and World Puja to hear James um, ourselves after. We take a break. We're going to have Daniel Brinkley on, on the first show uh, talking about near-death experiences. Have you mm-hmm. uh, met Daniel? Yes, I have. Okay, okay. Just just um, a uh, self, self-publication self there on behalf mm-hmm. of the Irish Side of the Moon. James, wh- what do you see or what do you see happening um, in the next coming days, weeks, and months here on planet Earth? Because things seem to have... We're not waiting for stuff to happen anymore. We're slapped um, in the middle of it. So, um, what what do you see happening? Well, what basically, mes- what messages have you been given by the the higher intelligences? Well, what they've been saying, and they used to give me specific information, and I I haven't even asked for the specifics anymore because it's just created so much havoc in my own life that you know I do share it with people close to me or, or people I know that might be affected by it. Uh, but, but uh, basically what they've been saying, they, they talk about this process, and they said, you know, that the, the greatest understanding of it is almost like the source itself is, is infiltrating the entire planet in every form on the planet uh, on the highest level. But what they're saying is that we are moving to a new place in space. Our whole solar system is highly energized. Uh, that's why we're seeing all the changes on all the planets, not just Earth. Like go- global warming is more like solar system warning. Uh, warming. I mean, it's it's happening. The whole solar system is going off. It's not just the cars that are doing it. They aggravate it a little bit, but it's mainly a much bigger event. But moving into this place, we're actually moving into this huge bubble of energy that is in alignment with galactic core, or, you know, the Mayans call it Hunabku, uh, everybody has a name for it, but it's, it's the, the beginning of this galaxy, you might say, and and that event that's happening right now, and with the planetary alignments coming up, and also an incoming body, you know, that that I think they're naming uh, Elenin, which is actually probably Nibiru, uh, coming in, all of these things are playing, you know, all at once on the Earth, so so there's all these things coming up to, up to uh, and through 2012, and what they're telling me is that this September, there's going to be a lot of, of shaking and rocking and rolling, and the Earth is just going to be really doing her thing, and, and nature is going to take down, the, you know, the present system between the the solar flares and the coronal mass ejections and, you know, the shaking and the pulses coming in. We're, we're getting hit by 500 uh, huge pulses of energy an hour from from sources unknown. We don't even know where this is coming from in the Earth. But you add all this together and there's no way the grid is going to stay together. It won't stay up. And there's no way the satellites are going to continue doing what they're doing up there as well. And, uh, you know, it, it's it's an obvious, you know, when you look at the dynamics behind this, it's very obvious that that we are going to have to prepare on every level, you know, mentally, uh, spiritually, emotionally, uh, physically, every level. We can't ignore any one level. And we're going to have to start living in harmony with each other and the planet and learn to share and work together and, and uh, 
to get through this process, basically. And, and it's going to be a very intense intense process coming up and, and you know a lot of the elite are planning on going into their holes you know they've built these massive cities underground uh, the problem with that is when you throw people with a lot of control issues and a lot of tyrants together in a hole it doesn't work out too good you know <laughs> especially when all this energy comes in and they have and all this comes up for them uh, and so that's going to be a real mess, and and these holes are going to crack and reel, and and gases and water and things like that are going to be filling up these holes. So, so there is nowhere to go with this other than, to me, I think it's focusing as a collective and trying to shield and and divert some of this stuff and change the outcome. You know, that's basically the only the only way out, and and get as much divine intervention as we can you know, to get through these processes. So so we are going to experience more uh, major earthquakes and volcanic eruptions. More tsunamis are going to be happening, you know, around the globe. We're, we're already going through a magnetic pole shift, and I think we're going to go through a physical, partial physical pole shift as well as the Earth straightens itself out. Um, and uh, and so we there, there's just... So many different levels. I, I also see major social, economic, and you know, changes. That that's undeniable. That's already underway, and it's looking like a global revolution uh, because people are just done with the tyrants. You know, they're done with the controllers and and where the controllers are taking them. Uh, you know, and these these things like Chernobyl and and. Uh, Fukushima and you know the Gulf oil crisis and all of these things are just blatant lessons in who is running you you know who is leading you who is where are they taking you and what are the consequences of allowing these people to continue you know running the program here. And, well, and for, for, okay. forgive me for jumping in, but it sounds yeah. like a perfect time. If I was part of the control program, it would be a perfect time to unveil. The false UFO invasion. Uh, yeah. Because if you, if people don't trust off-worlders, then they won't ask for help internally or externally. Um, mm -hmm. I, I, I hope I'm wrong. I hope I'm wrong. Yeah, there's there's a lot of people that are talking about that, uh, and uh, I think it's Carol Rosen was the first one that brought it out, and she works, you know, hand in hand with Werner von Braun, and who is the head of you know the the whole rocket program and everything else, and NASA, and, and we're involved in that big time, and, and he made it very clear, he said, you know, the powers that be, he said, they're going to create these wars, one war after another, and he even named them, you know, and he talked about, you know, the, the Iraq, and, and uh, you know, all these, all these wars, you know, Afghanistan, all these things, and he said, and then, you know, they're going to move to Iran and try to create a war there, and, um, uh, you know, he said they're going to start running out of enemies to keep the war industry going. So then they're going to turn to disasters, you know, like like uh, comets and things like that. And then their final their final uh, turn is going to be to a mock ET invasion. And and you can see Hollywood is preparing everybody for this. All the movies coming out, even the, the little ET movie now, they're biting the heads off of people and. And uh, the new one, you know, they have Battle for L.A., uh, the, the War of the Worlds one, you know, all of these things, these things coming out now are, it's all some weird creature bug thing coming to eat us, slice and dice us, and turn us into human skin off, you know. And so they are guiding the uh, consciousness to, uh, in that direction so they can do their final uh, mock ET invasion and, and get a somebody, you know, again, create a huge problem with them being the, have everybody react to it and them being the solution because that's how they work. It's, you know, problem, reaction, solution. Or, but I, I really do believe enough people know about this that they aren't going to pull it off. And and we might even get some intervention by the ETs themselves are going to say, you're grounded, <laughs> you know. You know, you're you're not going to be attacking your own people, and and I think there's a huge awakening in the masses too. I mean, everybody I know of knows about this. I know that that I'm talking to the choir, but 
this mock ET invasion and false war the world scenario, uh, there are so many people that know about it, I would be surprised if they would even try to pull it off. Yeah. Okay, I hope so. I hope so. And one very um, selfish question now, which basically shows shows my level of consciousness. Um, <laughs> if I were to now go after this uh, interview and sit down, um, if you could possibly tune in, who do I reach out to so I can be of service? Who do I reach out? Because I do feel that um, in some way, I don't know, I want to go home. I don't know yeah, yeah. Is is uh -huh. side? I've been. Uh, anyway, I'm here in Lanzarote. This is not my home, but it's my home for now. But I realized yeah. two days ago that I want to go home, and mm -hmm. it was very, 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 very intense. I want to go home, so I realized yeah. that again. I want to go. I don't know. I could. I could. I can't put words on it. You know what I mean? Yeah, I do. Yeah. Yeah. And basically, so home, home is coming here. Uh, we. You know, it's our job here to create heaven on earth, and we're bringing that consciousness of those off-world experiences and lives and things here to the earth to assist earth in, in her process, and it's not, it's right around the corner where, you know, we're seeing all the ships manifesting and around the world globally. Uh, it's, it's increasing exponentially, and it's just not too far out. I mean, I think it's within the next year and a half is, is there's going to be undeniable uh, contact with the masses. Uh, you know, you know, getting into that, too, is that, and I've seen some of the top leaders do it, and, and at the Prophets Conference where I just spoke, uh, same thing. You know, people got up and said, well, when is it going to happen in mass? When are the ETs going to present themselves to a large group of people? You know, they go, that hasn't happened yet, so they're, they're pushing contact into the future always, always pushing it into the future. It hasn't happened yet, it's into the future. You know, whereas just here we have 300 people at a time initiating contact and ships flying right over the buildings here and, and for everybody to film. And that's been going on for years, so so that's kind of an issue. But going back to your, your personal uh, experience, uh, rather than do it over the air, what I can do is uh, we have techniques of divination where I can find out exactly who you're working with and the names of them, and, you know, who's best to work with, and I can uh, do that, send that to you in an email. Um, okay. You know, but uh, that, that would be the best way. The only reason I'm not doing it now is because if I just pull it now, I may be off a little bit. Yeah. And, and to ensure that I give you really clear information, I'd rather use these other techniques we use that, that we get very concise, clear information. Okay. You know, okay but, I appreciate but I, that. Yeah. But I think everybody, you know, you'd be surprised if you would just sit, uh, get yourself away from, get in a space where you're not going to be interrupted, you know, a clear space, and do the clearing work first, and then ask. You'll be surprised at what happens. You'll either feel a presence come to you and just be aware of what that feels like so when it comes to you again. And, uh, you know, or you may get a name or an image. You know, you might even depends on, on your gifts. You know, some people are clairaudient and they'll hear things. Some people are clairvoyant and they'll see a being appearing to them. Uh, some people are clairsentient and they'll feel the presence of, of energies. And so it depends on the individual as to what you experience. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, um, that's coming near the end of the uh, the show, uh, folks. Okay. Um, again, James, um, I'm sure the guys, myself, anyway, um, uh, next season or the season after, would love to have you back because I know that you're a very, very busy man with your own shows and all the work you're mm -hmm. doing, um, grounding. And as you said, it's not in the future. You're doing it now and you're helping other people doing it. Other people are helping you and everybody's helping everybody else. And uh, I'm sure you're creating quite an impact where you live and people are seeing that and they can't really deny it, even people who are still trapped in mind. Um, mm -hmm. Any last words that you would like to share with people? You know, basically, um, I'm really praying for a peaceful revolution, but we need one. <laughs> you know, we need one fast. And and we have to really wake up and pay attention to what's happening, you know, over our heads, to our environment, 
and who's leading us and where they're leading us. Uh, you know, we have to stop, you know, participating in any way with anything that's harmful to humanity, Earth, and, and really start gathering together and live lives in harmony with each other and the Earth and, and become self-analyzing, you know, build your own observer and go there and observe yourself when you're flipping out or blaming or, or going through a process and realize that it's a process and, and ask, you know, the God within you to help you with this process. Uh, that's the main thing right now. I, I asked the Palladians, you know, why are you here right now? And they told me to release the past. And then I asked them, can you go more in depth than that? And they said that your past is creating your tomorrow. And some of your cultures are holding on to these extreme grudges and, and wrong conclusions from past experiences, and it's actually psychometrized into the land itself, you know, through wars and, and, and other things. So they said it's so important right now that we drop, you know, the old grudges, the wounds, the traumas, and wrong conclusions from past experiences and start uniting, you know, as a whole and working in the highest and best good of humanity in the earth. Okay. Well, that sounds like... Um, sound words for anyone. Uh, I can see it in, right across the board. Um, yeah. Everybody needs to to do it. And if you want to reach out to see some of James's um, fabulous photographs and um, written material, just go to www.eseti.org. Um, some fantastic stuff on there. Um, and also, please join us in the healing meditations too and there's a free newsletter where we can let people know when we're doing these meditations okay and they can access that on the site you said a yeah. .org? yeah on the website okay. or, or they can go to Ustream and just type in eSETI and, and it's Ustream and just type in eSETI and it should pop up and at 7 o'clock p.m. you know Pacific Standard Time we're going to to do a meditation Ustream yeah Ustream. Is that Y O U S T R E A M? Ustream. Yeah, no, it's just U. It's just the, let, the letter U and then stream. Ah, okay. Ustream. Gotcha. Well, James, uh, it's been a pleasure. Uh, keep doing what you're doing. And uh, if you ever want to come back on the show, just give us a shout. Great. Yeah, anytime. I, I love doing other radio shows more than my own. <laughs> And if you see a strange-looking Irish guy coming with a real Lanzarote tan around the mid to end of May this year, uh, it might be me. Great. Yeah, any time. I, I always tell people, come see for yourself. I mean, they're, they're here, and people have life-changing experiences. Right. Okay, and, and would May end of May be a good time to go, yeah? Yeah, watch the weather. You know, if it's raining and cloudy, it's pretty hard to see anything. But you'll definitely feel the energy here, even though you don't, may not be able to see much. Yeah. Okay, well, have a great uh, healing meditation tonight, and take all care right. of yourself. Uh, all right, thank thanks you for having me on the much. Show. Not at all. My pleasure. All right, take care, James. All right. Well, that was and is the crux of the matter. Um, if you, like me, have a lot of work to do on yourself, well, now's the time to start. Drop the anger, drop the jealousy, drop the resentment, drop all that stuff, stop blaming. Yes, we can hold people responsible for their actions, as we hold ourselves responsible for our own thoughts and behaviors. Now, coming up next week, uh, actually, not next week, we're taking a break for a couple of weeks, and the first interview of the new season uh, will be with Danian Brinkley on near-death experiences, and that interview will be with our own Tommy. So, folks, until again, thank you for joining us here. Uh, stay safe, stay curious. And keep up the good work. Take care, guys. We are Irish Side of the Moon. Freedom of information. Personal empowerment. The Irish Side of the Moon. I still have a dream. This is just a ride. We can change it anytime we want. It's only a choice. No effort, no work, no job, no savings of money. A choice right now between fear and love. Love, love, love.
Freedom of information, personal empowerment, the Irish side of the moon.